Catherine, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing today, Kurt? I'm doing great, as well as can be expected for <laughs> being in our in, in my house for, for how many weeks now? Two, yeah. three weeks. <laughs> so, exactly. I, I, there's a context that we say this in. Yes, exactly. It's funny because I I'm I tend my friends tend to joke about the fact that you know I'm a homebody or I don't normally travel outside of a two mile radius, mm -hmm. and you know and I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. However, as soon as they tell you you have to stay home, I'm like I don't want to stay. <laughs> home. <laughs> I want four miles. All of a sudden, exactly. it wants to happen. It's a little funny how we don't like to be told what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, what do you think that is? Is that just is that just uh, our mind? Because as humans, we just don't like being told what to do. And we yeah. always want the opposite of what we can have. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the sense of freedom is uh, a human thing, not just kind of a Western culture thing. So you had freedom because you always knew you could go as far as you wanted to go. And so it's not even about the actual thing. It's that feeling of um, confinement or entrapment. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I agree. Well, how are you holding up during all this craziness out there in uh -huh. Oregon? <laughs> well, I, I always try to practice um, what I offer. And so it's about myself staying well physically, emotionally, tethered to people. You know, my client base, uh, you know, things are more intense. Uh, so I really need to stay resourced also for the work that I do. Um, so, you know, it's all of these things about how to navigate difficult times, um, and I believe in them wholeheartedly. So, so far, so good in terms of physical wellness and emotional wellness. And, you know, we're like in a tunnel that we don't know exactly where the end is. So it's, it's like a marathon, not a race. Um, and to really have sustaining practices and ways of taking care of ourselves. So that's what I'm thinking about, too. It's not just how am I doing today, but two weeks from now. How do I make sure I'm doing okay also? Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm very happy to have you on the show because I think that uh, we've concentrated or focused a lot of attention on the fact that, you know, this is a time that you, to, you, know, that you can take care of yourself, that you can uh, do physical activities, you know, start exercising, that will help. And I think we focus a lot of attention on the body, being a personal trainer, you know, that's my natural inclination is tell people, look, there's ways to work out at home. In fact, you can take advantage of this time, all this free time to get in the best shape of your life. It's just how you look at it. You know, you can either sit there and go, this is a very difficult time and you can worry about it and sit on the couch and, and, and watch mm -hmm. Netflix till, you know, your eyes pop out. Or yeah. you can get off the couch and, and, and exercise and do things uh, to make your, you know, to get you better health. However, because we focus so much on the physical, I don't think there's been a whole lot out there about uh, focusing attention on our, on our mental and emotional health. And that's why I love having you on here because I know that you, that, you, know, you can give us tips and how to mentally stay healthy during, during these time, you know, this time and, and, actually, and actually get not just mental, stay mentally healthy, but become even more healthy. <laughs> healthier than we healthier, already are there yes. you go <laughs> well using it as that opportunity um so that plays into a number i love the mind body connection kurt and i'm glad that that's um um part of the invitation for me to be on that podcast you know kind of like where our body goes our our psyche follows and where our psyche goes our body follows so if i think an anxious anxious thought and if I'm too focused on the future and can't contend with the uncertainty, not working with that well, my body is going to feel that. Exactly. Uh, so it's about wellness and immune system as much as fitness and the other ideas of health. So um, they go together. And I think what I'm um, really seeing in my practice is, though I have a ton of time now or more, I'm not necessarily doing all the things I could be doing. So, you know, yes, I could be even on the treadmill an hour and a half today, but I'm doing nothing. So some of this, the effect of this is it's taken a toll psychologically. There's loss, there's a sense of grief, there's definitely anxiety with uncertainty. So we kind of go into almost like a trance state or a disassociative state rather than a, wow, we don't have much time, this is a little break and let me take, 
take really extra good care of myself. So that's where a routine or a structure can really help so that we make sure we're taking care of those needs. Um, because just because we have the time, not, not all of us are using the time. Right. So, you, so you're, you're suggesting that people set up a routine just like they would have in their normal day. You know, they get up, they have breakfast, they get a shower, they go to work and, and then they do their job at work. And so there's a routine or structure to that. So you're saying you should, you know, create some sort of structure and some sort of routine for yourself, even if you're at home, you know, like you get up, you have breakfast, you maybe get on the treadmill, you know, for, 30 minutes or something and then you know and then have your your day planned out so that you don't end up doing nothing all day and then feeling bad about it exactly yes and especially the feeling bad about it at the end of the day and so right. then we've got some negative stuff going on in our minds and our hearts which is not helpful right now um, yes, I would even go as far as um, encouraging uh, couples to have a date night, even though it might be in a different room, <laughs> just uh, at a different, you know, once a week kind of thing, to still keep the sense of normalcy, part of this uncertainty, it's at a level we don't normally contend with. So the more we can do that's familiar, it really is the scaffolding that our mental health relies on to feel um, grounded and to kind of find our feet beneath us. So it's about making sure we take care of ourselves. It also gives us a sense of predictability and, and a little bit more of a, um, a locus of control. Yes, I think it's huge. Sometimes for some people, they kind of need some unstructured time in the structured time because they don't like that feeling of entrapment. Like now I have to eat at this time. So part of the trick is to be flexible about it. I don't want to go out for a run right now. It's raining. Okay, what else can I do to move my body? And I agree. And I think, too, when people start setting this structure and routine, not to overdo it, not to put too much on your plate. Because I know, especially when people work out, they think, okay, I have to go to the gym five, you know, five days out of the week, and I have to run five days. In, and they put so much on their plate that their bodies and their mind just can't keep up with it. Because it's like you went from doing nothing to all of this at once and mm -hmm. you're just not prepared for that so you know i tell them take baby steps you don't have to do everything at once you don't have to have the perfect workout in your first day out and and just you know take a little bit at a time doing something is better than doing nothing so would you say that you know like doing the same thing as far as having a structure and routine is don't overpack your day with with too much stuff like you know and build on that Yes, I would, I would go even one step further because it, that's kind of a platform for part of the discussion that sometimes our, our, the fullness, it's kind of finding that right amount where I'm not in lethargy and then I don't feel bad at the end of the day not using this time that I have available to me, but not being so busy that uh, for some people, busyness is actually a distraction, almost right. a way to not feel what's going on. And part of emotional wellness on the other side of this think about what causes depression isolation right so we are all needing to isolate yet that is affecting our system just like fear does so creating safety where we feel afraid whether it's just taking care of our body or having a budget if i'm worried about money and definitely allowing yourself to feel the emotions you know we're in a culture that sometimes will feel an emotion and then think about it we don't really stay with it we're afraid of that when actually that emotion moves it always has a beginning middle and an end so that's the thing is if we don't overbook our day we're probably going to be in touch with deeper emotions and that's not a bad thing um, that's part of just having emotional intelligence is letting those emotions, processing those emotions within yourself, potentially with another, a friend, a family member, a therapist, and then kind of keeping up with uh, what, how this is an emotionally impactful situation, right? Not just keeping our bodies healthy. So, all right, so I have a couple questions of what you just said. So with this physical distancing thing that we have going on right now, how can pe what's, what are some of the best ways people can stay connected? during this time yeah because it's again so important um, whether we saw people regularly or not or whatever that looked like for us now the stakes are higher are uh, we 
we can't get out as much. There's just a loss in that. So um, I actually have been encouraging people to start with an inner piece, like an inner world piece of know the connection is there, feel it inside. If we really, just like if someone's passed, we don't see them physically, but we can feel our connection to them. So there's an inside starting place for that. And then secondly, and importantly, using all the technologies possible, um, not just texting, but making phone calls, not just phone calls, but potentially doing Zoom sessions um, so that we are very much in touch with the people that, um, you know, our circle, inner circle, and maybe the larger circle. It's going to make all the difference. Um, and so especially for people that live alone, they especially need to have maybe two or three contacts a day, even if it's just small, like five minutes, like I get to see your face. And, you know, we're having a cup of coffee together. Um, I think is huge. And then thirdly, you know, some of us are able to be out as long as we're physically distancing um, with masks or not masks. And so even with strangers, what I'm seeing is some are some pretty sweet looks on the path that goes by the river here in Portland, you know, of we're all in this together. And even though I don't know that person, it does undo a kind of aloneness and feeling of isolation. Um, it's connective. And if you have a mask on, you can wave. So it's, it's even that I would offer to people. It's funny because you, when you're talking, I, so many questions pop into my head <laughs> um, because I should probably mention to the listeners that you're a new author and you wrote a book called River to Ocean. And, uh, and when you talked about, you know, uh, connecting with your inner self, and becoming friends I, when this is one of the things I loved uh, and I must and I want to tell everybody it's such an insightful book I mm. love the metaphors you use it was just it was brilliant and I mm, and thank you I'm somebody who who's who has uh, studied in this field for a long time and I thought the way that you wrote this and the metaphors you used were so relatable mm. that I, I love the book and uh, and mm, I would recommend it you. to anybody thank you um, and you said something where I never thought about it because one of the things I always tell people is that you need to learn to love yourself. And people, I think, have a really difficult time understanding how to do that. And so I explained that. You said something in the book, which I go, wow, that makes even more sense. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, you need to learn to become a friend with yourself. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, because again, I think before you can love yourself, you have to like yourself and you would have to actually want to be friends with yourself. Yeah. And if you can't get there, yeah. you're never going to get to the, oh, I love myself part. So I yeah. thought, wow, how brilliant, you know? Right, exactly. Well, and there's so much packed into the idea of our relationship to ourselves. And sadly, um, living in a culture where there can be a message that having a relationship with oneself is narcissistic, it's a self-involvement, when in fact, it is really the absence of a true relationship to self where we tend to be too self-involved and, um, and not really relational and generous with others. And so, yes, this kind of, we have to befriend ourselves, just that idea that there's kind of a duality in that. There's Catherine who's also befriending Catherine. So there's one human being, but that is not just a passive thing then. Then my inner dialogue, whether I know myself is intrinsically worthy, you know, all the things um, that go on inside of me, um, it opens that up in a very different way than just, I exist, so that's my relationship to myself. You know, I go through my day, I do my things, um, yeah. Yeah, I love that you keyed on that. And sometimes some of us have to get through some self-forgiveness. We have to take some inventory of what gets in the way of loving ourselves. And when we do that and move through that, um, we are all human. We've all been unconscious. So I try to offer a path to finding that kind of inner peace with oneself. Then loving ourselves isn't just kind of a nice idea or, you know, in a self-help book. It feels real. It's a felt experience of that. Right. Yes, I, I completely agree. You talk about um, a, a particular part that hit me. And I must say that it took me a long time to overcome this. And I, but I saw in the book, I go, yep, that was me. So, you know, uh, it was about the ego and letting, mm -hmm. and letting go of the ego. And you said the ego comes from a place of fear, like it's there to protect us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I never thought about it 
quite like that. I go, you're absolutely right. That's, but you also talk about the ego being necessary. And there was a, a part where you, you were talking about the ego being healthy for us, um, where it's, it's a cultivated resilience or, um, uh, or strengths of, of our core sense of self. Mm -hmm. And I was, and so you want to elaborate, in, maybe? Yeah, elaborate? Sure. It gets a bad rap in the sense that ego, being egotistical, you know, we can all conjure up what that feels like, that person that walks in the room, you know, maybe they grab all the attention or um, they kind of put other people down to feel better about themselves. So the ego gone awry is what we want to be aware of. But you and I would not be sitting here having this conversation, Kurt, if there hadn't been developmentally along the development of our human Ness, um, our, our journey, ego strength. So that's what you're referring to. So that's that sense of self that's important. Um, then when our ego is needed in terms of a fight or flight kind of response to protect us, um, it's important to really cherish all the things that make us whole. It's more when that ego comes online and holds up that shield or believes there's a sense of threat when there is no danger and then that becomes our sense of self and ego self rather than our relaxed open trusting connected loving self right so where it needs to protect us or help us develop as a human being we really honor the ego um, but we don't want it being in charge in a certain way so in that part of the book i i put ego friend or foe because there's there's traditions that kind of would offer that we're supposed to completely transcend the ego and in certain moments absolutely we can but i'm a i'm a fan of if it exists then it's there for a reason um and developmentally absolutely for all of us in terms of human development so i see this time again and i believe it's all about you know an attitudinal value of how you how you perceive things so um i you know, i'm a big believer that uh, your beliefs, you know, precede your perceptions, your perceptions precede your reality. And so if you can change your beliefs, you can change your perceptions and therefore change your reality. So um, we can decide on, on this time that we're dealing with right now of, of being at home and, and going through these, you know, these challenging times of how we're going to handle them. We can either sit there and say, woe is me, or we can sit there and look at this as a time of opportunity. And I see this as a time for us to actually become more aware or our experiences, uh, this wakefulness that you, that you talk about and being able to overcome the old self and becoming better, you know, through being aware of who we are and, and, uh, and things of this nature. How would you, I, I, I guess, like, what would be your advice to people? Who might go you know what i want to take this time to look inside myself and and to become aware of who i truly am because i agree with you 100 percent like when i let my ego run the show basically i realized that i was living up to what people perceived me to be and so i felt like this need to be this person and at mm -hmm. some point i go you know what I, I don't want to be that person anymore and i need yeah. to i need to change that for me and not continue acting the way i think people expect me to act and, yes and i know that was my ego just saying they're going well this is who you are you know <laughs> and i'm like it's not yeah. who I have to be. yes and the ego can you know ego always wants to look good so it can right masks, right <laughs> it's basically competitive so that's not great um if we want to live in a connective way with others um because that's a really different kind of path so having to look good and competing and having that sense of separation is a really painful existence and it comes from somewhere when we are adults experiencing our ego so my encouragement in, in this time where we might have a few minutes a day to sit and reflect is to think about you know where how far back that belief system goes what sourced the belief about the yourself kurt where you felt like you might have to prove yourself or um be a certain kind of way that we would we're calling right now an ego state which isn't really who you are because if we go back in time we weren't born necessarily other than the developmental process 
we were born connected to others, trusting others, not competing. If I'm a twin and I'm an infant, I'm not, I don't know myself to compete with my twin for food. I don't, you know, that's not organically there. And so the idea would be somewhere along the way, usually in childhood, something happened such that the young brain organizes its sense of self around that circumstance or that event or that trauma. And that's where the belief you know, um, grows over time with this idea of confirmation bias. So if I have a belief about myself, like I'm not good enough, then my mind has a way of confirming that belief all through, you know, my right. experience, my day to day. And so th that's the frightening thing is not only are these beliefs not true about who we really are, we have a mind that's constantly looking for evidence. Um, there's a great suffering in that. And so your idea of like taking this time and really looking within of what do I believe about myself? Who am I really? Am I living my most authentic life? Um, and what might that look like on the other side of this pandemic as an opportunity for change, I think is a really powerful um, upside to being sheltering at home and having more time on our hands. Yeah, absolutely. Because I realized when, when I was able to get out of my ego and make those changes, I, I understood. I was like, wow, I've held myself back for so many years by buying into this whole nonsense. Because you said, like you said, you're always worried about looking good for, you know, to everybody. Right. And so right. you'll do certain things that aren't necessary, necessarily beneficial to you, but you do them because you think it's, that's how you're going to look your best you know, in front of mm -hmm. people. And so it is, it's amazing once you let go of that and allow the change to happen, you know, how much, how much freer you are and how you're able to um, expand from, from who yes. you were and, and, and grow. What if somebody, I mean, someone who's listening to this says, oh, that sounds great. That's something I've always wanted to do. Right. Where do they start? Like, what's a basic exercise you go, look, this is how you start to, um, in order to be able to grow so that you cannot just uh, be mentally healthy, but become mentally stronger and emotionally stronger. Well, and yes, and like you say, kind of having a sense of self that's holistic and is not in the ego. So um, I think that's why in the book I start with befriending you as the first aspect of wakefulness. And within that chapter, that aspect, it is so much uh, relies on a sense of intrinsic worth or a lack thereof of intrinsic worth, right? Because the ego is about proving ourselves. And so if we truly knew that we were enough, as we we were born into that knowing it lives within us, but again, circumstances or messages along the way compromise that knowing that that's the starting place is what is my relationship to worth? Is it because I have a great job so then I can feel good about myself? Is it because I look good or I'm attractive? Is it because I'm partnered? Does that give me worth? So just like love, worth is generally conditional. And so the freedom from the ego is the healing of that, that injury in, in a way, what lives inside of us as the trance of unworthiness. We need to change that. And it goes a huge distance on many levels in that sense of authenticity and living as our true self and not having the ego run the show. And so in my book, I, I put some practices in because this is a nice idea. It's for many people listening. It might not be a new idea, intrinsic worth. But how do I move from an idea into it being the felt experience inside of me? And so, you know, first of all, just the awareness of times that I'm not feeling good enough. I could start to challenge that thought. Is that a story I have about myself? Is that a projection I'm putting on someone else that they're judging me and they, they think I'm less than and that may not be happening? Um, for some of us, we have to undo perfectionism because, you know, perfectionism is sourced by a sense of I have to be perfect because my worth relies on it. So it's actually even to, to let myself get a B or just be okay with a B, like in practical terms. Or I was a, a good mom today. Maybe it was not my strongest day as a mom. and that being okay. So making it yours, making it happen in direct um, experience is how we change from the inside out and move something from, again, an idea that sounds really good to our own journey, really embodied within us. And 
So I have, I have another question because I've dealt with this with other people. You run into people a lot of times who sit there and they say, I love myself. And you know they don't. Mm-hmm. And you can tell because I always, I always go by people's actions rather than their words. So when someone says, I love myself, and I see they're 150 pounds overweight, I go, you don't love yourself. Mm-hmm. Because if you did, you wouldn't do this to yourself. Mm-hmm. And I actually had a, a situation where I was at um, a conference, if you will, and there was this woman who was pushing this whole, you know, that she was overweight and she was pushing this acceptance and, and talking about how much she loved herself. Now, I believe that you should love yourself no matter who or what you are and no matter where you are in your life. But I believe that if you truly love yourself, you'll, your actions will begin to show that and, and that you'll do the things that are best for you. Because when you love someone, you don't do things to hurt them. You do things to help them. And so when I see people say they love themselves and yet I see their actions are hurting them rather than helping them, I challenge them on whether or not that's real. And so I challenged this woman on on whether or not she loved herself. And by the time I got done with her, she realized that it wasn't what she was. It was a feigned love. It was this projection she was putting out there uh, because she was trying to sell something, but I'm sure it, it goes beyond that. Um, you know, it's the let people, it's that ego going, see, I'm, you know, she's putting herself in her best light. Like I'm, I'm accepting of myself and really she wasn't. And because again, her actions were contrary to, to what she was saying. When, when you, when you have someone like, how does someone get away from that ego like you know i know that you said you have practices and you do in your book which i think or exercise which i think are great to make people become aware of when this kind of behavior happens when you're not being honest with yourself to step back and go i need to you know i need to reevaluate is what i is what i'm saying is it true by you know can i you know and you can Mm -hmm. tell through your actions would you would you agree Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And having been myself worked through um, obesity, I was 200 pounds at 16 years old and um, didn't think I loved myself at that point. Um, Whatever our body weight needs to be, and we do need to be really sophisticated about ideas of that and a culture that can can do body shaming. Um, The kind of what I'm hearing is this kind of thing that doesn't line up of like, you're saying this, but it doesn't feel true. And it doesn't seem true with what your choices are. That I think you're saying so well, Kurt, of why we need an actual relationship to ourselves, because that's the foundation that begins the awareness, then the conversation, including self-talk and the then decisions that stream from a place of if we love something that's precious if it's precious we take care of it Um, and I I, one of the inner kind of world pieces in the book are about cherishing the body Um, I I lost weight the hard way by self-loathing by hating myself by because it was wrong wrong, you know and then I stopped and the rest of the weight um, came off and finding true health for me was in an environment of self-acceptance and love that when I said I want to protect you to my body and actually have conversations with my body. That means I wouldn't, I would move. I would not overeat. I would listen to it. Right. Rather than kind of a top down approach of like, I just have to do these things. And then my ego would get involved and not want to be deprived. I mean, I could white knuckle a diet, but it wasn't really this, what you're speaking of this bottom up approach of loving ourselves is about how we treat ourselves, and that includes how we take care of our bodies. That's yes. what you just said. Loving ourselves is, is about how we treat ourselves. I think that that, <laughs> is, that is key. You're absolutely mm-hmm. correct. Um, so you, you deal with clients, and, and let's, let's get back to like what we're going through right now today. So people tend to handle things differently. You, you, you're going to have everyone from those who ignore the warnings and go out and think they can do whatever they want to do, go to out in public and, 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 not care, and not have a care in the world because they're just going to ignore everything. All the way from to the other extreme, to people who won't go out of their house without almost like a hazmat suit. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what kind of advice do you have for 
you know, those who have such different ways of handling things uh, in a situation like this? Well, I think we need to stay on our own lane in terms of just finding what is our right path. Uh, there can be a lot of judgment about people who are frightened. Um, I have a number of client, clients, by the way, that they don't look like they're at risk for COVID-19. You would not, you know, uh, know that. They're runners, they're, they're active, they're not in what we thought initially was the vulnerable age group, but they're very vulnerable. And so I think just, you know, looking at how oneself navigates it is kind of the starting place. Um, well informed, hopefully, that um, it's not an under or over reaction. But again, there's a bandwidth there of what you may do and feel safe and comfortable with versus what I might do and feel safe and comfortable with. It's tricky when family members get involved and you've got one person or parent having a really different opinion of like what that looks like. Right. like how safe to be, how much sheltering at home, who gets to come into the house. Um, that, those are the kinds of challenges families are dealing with now too, between co-parents as much as between especially teenagers and parents right now. Um, so I, I, I would say there's, um, you know, a path of just um, being well informed again, taking good care in the ways we've already described as, as the parameters I would work with, but every individual is going to know what they need in terms of how much to stay involved socially, um, how much to be exercising in terms of their own mental health, um, those kinds of things. Yeah, I think we respecting other people so if i go out to the store and i see people with gloves and masks and everything else on I, and though i may not feel the need to take that you know length of precaution i respect the fact that that's who they are and that's what they feel makes them feel safe and and i think that regardless of where i what i think everyone should be able to do it to the level that they feel is you know uh, necessary for them um, like yeah, you said. yeah. And it brings up the point about just this idea, this just good practice anyway of projection. It's kind of like when I'm on the freeway and somebody's, you know, annoying me with how they're driving. And if we're in good practice, we remember, we don't know if that person just got told, you know, a parent died, they're on the way to the hospital for something. Like we're, so it's the same thing when we're out seeing how people are contending with a pandemic to just stay very um, in touch with how little we know. We have not walked in those moccasins and we may be the one that would ask that of the world around us to be kind and thoughtful about um, why I'm making the particular choice I feel called to make. Yes, I think this is, the, it, you know, there's, there's, this is such an opportunity right now to, um, be respectful within a, a level of diversity. I always think of diversity, our main challenge with diversity is, is not about the typical ways we think about it, but actually diversity of perspective. We don't do well with that. And this is an opportunity to really, really um, strengthen our ability to. And I think something that, uh, that's important is that, you know, like you said, especially the driving part, <laughs> It's like we don't we don't know what that person's gone through, and I've caught myself at times going, thinking about that person, going, you know, maybe something happened mm. to that person. That's why yeah. they're behaving the way they do. I don't think it hap I don't think I do it enough. You know, mm. where uh, instead I I I um, react rather than act, and so I sit there and mm -hmm. and you know get upset because someone upset me. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that because when you're changing and when you're you're uh, doing the best to change and, and become uh, better at thinking about other people's you know feelings and things of that nature, to realize you don't have to be perfect because I know that you know oftentimes people go, oh, you haven't changed, you're mm. still the same old person. I'm going, and at first I bought into that and I go, no, wait a second, I am changing. No, I haven't. I haven't completely changed yet because I still have those moments where I get angry instead of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about the situation and what could have caused that person to behave a certain way. But I find that I'm more and more, I am taking that person's feelings into consideration. So mm -hmm. I am changing. I'm changing slowly. And mm -hmm. change doesn't happen overnight. So it, it's important that people, I believe, understand 
that you don't have to be perfect in this changing process you know that it doesn't have to you it doesn't have to be perfect you don't either have to you know do it all right at once or you don't do it at all you know you work on it like everything else you don't get the body that you want by you know by having one workout <laughs> it doesn't work that way unfortunately so right. well i i um fashion uh again kind of going to metaphor change is uh a dimmer switch not an up and down light switch um, it's actually not even good in a way to have change happen so quickly because our whole system is, if we're going to sustain change, if that's really the end game, then we need to do it in a steady but incremental kind of way. But ultimately, Kurt, what we're all doing is building a new part of a brain. These are neural pathways that we're building and you can't do those overnight. And thank goodness there is neuroplasticity, which when I went into this practice almost 20 years ago, they didn't have the research. It felt really good to go to a therapist and it seemed transformative, but it wasn't neurobiological. We didn't understand the how powerful this impact is um, to be on a path of self-discovery and self-evolution. So I love your point about being gentle with oneself, that it isn't about perfectionism, it isn't about speed. Um, it is about consistency and kind of giving ourselves the grace, but that is again a biological reality too. Sometimes when we report change, um, I don't know who in your life might have said that or, or you've noticed someone saying they're changing, but it doesn't seem that different. There, I always think of a marathon of like, well, we're on the change wherever I am in my change process. Everyone in my life is at least three miles back, maybe right. more. And right. so to know that, to know like, and the, the people can be kind of mad, like, don't you see, I'm so different because we <laughs> feel so different on the inside exactly. and we are so much, you know, like you say, you're kinder on the road, you're thinking empathically, like you have that consciousness. Um, so I think that's why going back to relationship to self, we can be our own kind of cheerleader and not, not rely on other people to notice, please notice me. It's great when they do and they will if we're consistent uh, over time right. but we can say I see you Catherine or you can say I see you Kurt I really can acknowledge um, how much is different and I think yeah again that um, self-awareness and be able to see the difference in yourself and realize that other people probably aren't going to see it as much as you see it because you're more aware of it because you're you see all you know all the changes you're making and yet they may be somewhat subtle to other people and they don't notice them yet. And not to rely on their judgment and, and their criticism, rely on your own and, and continue with the, you know, doing what you're doing. Because like you said, over time, if you're consistent, they're going to see it and they're going to start mentioning it. It's sort of like, you know, someone who, like when you were at 200 pounds, you may have lost 10 pounds and no one may have noticed except you. And you're like, why isn't anyone noticing I lost 10 pounds? <laughs> right. It was huge, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, yes, and looking for approval, you know, that kind of goes back to our earlier um, piece around the ego. The ego is looking for approval because it's looking for validation. And um, when we're free from that, it's really relieving. It is, it is a kind of freedom in that. Like, it's great when people compliment and see us and give it, and we're, we're innately tethered to others. There's a human need for that. But not in the way many experience it. So to be contented with our own observations that, that I see you um, to oneself, it can be huge. Yes. And important to stay encouraged when I needed to lose a lot of weight. 200 pounds was a lot for my physical frame. Um, I had a ways to go. So again, kind of, I needed that inner cheerleader and a, an observer and witness um, and not relying on others so much. Yeah, and, um, you, and you really have to depend on, you. and again, I think this is one of the important things, is depend on your opinion, depend on yourself yeah. and not the outside criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, because what's even worse is not the fact that people don't notice, is that, I, and I tell people this when they're losing weight, I go, you're going to have this happen, and it, where you'll lose 10 pounds, and people go, did you put on weight? <laughs> <laughs> and then the funny thing is you have the opposite where you'll put on weight and people will ask you have you lost weight and mm -hmm. you're like, what's wrong with you know how right. how yeah 
and it's and it's funny when that kind of stuff happens. So it is. It's very it's very important that we become dependent on our ourselves and and our own uh, opinions and, and knowing what we're doing and and have faith in that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So all right. So again, dealing with what what's going on right now in a situation that everybody's going through right now. Um, one of the things that I've noticed because I, you know, I get on Facebook and, and I don't watch the news a lot. I notice that people are just like on Facebook constantly and they're watching the news constantly where I, you know, it's gotta be unhealthy. Like what is, you know, I know they want to be informed, but when is it too much? When is there too much news and too yeah. much social media to where you just got, you need to break away from that? Well, to, to start with an understanding of where that's coming from. So the idea is, I don't know what's happening. So information feels like it creates a sense of safety. And certainly, um, it creates um, a sense of navigating this, uh, an amount of information. We need it. We need to know if we're flattening the curve. We need to know when our kids can go back to school. That's real stuff. So having a healthy relationship to the news is always a good idea these days anyway, but especially now. But to your point, a good thing, more of it is not necessarily better. So I always like to use our bodies as ways that we intuit what's right and best for us. So if we track our anxiety, I have anxiety, Kurt, if I don't know what's happening at all. So then I start to engage with the news, a reliable source, a very just kind of balanced source, whatever that is for folks. And then I get information and I watch that anxiety settle a little bit. But then as I watch more and probably don't get that much better information, right. maybe conflicting, but like, it's not like, you know, then I go past almost like an addict, um, like what's good for me and how do we always know what's good for us is, is ultimately a tuning fork to, that lives inside of us. So that's what we want to watch, um, is how much to watch. Like what, what does Catherine's reaction kind of point to in terms of where that line in the sand is? And another challenge that we're dealing with is right now that a lot of times the media for years and years now, they tend to sensationalize things. And so, you know, I, I'm not a person who gets anxious, um, Yet I could I could sit there and watch the news and go, what are they doing? You know, I understand wanting to keep people informed to where they you know they they take this seriously, and yet there comes a point where it's it's almost like they're making it worse by sensationalizing. And, we're, and I live in Florida, so we deal with this every year. Whenever a hurricane comes, they act as if it's going to be the one that tears the state in half. You know, basically. Right. And and it gets to a point where you don't believe it anymore. And, mm. and it's, a, it's like, you know, uh, who's the, uh, I forget the chicken little, the sky's falling. Sky's falling. Oh, right. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And then people are like, no. <laughs> you know, it's, right. And, when it, when, and then we get caught on, you know, unaware because right. we, we quit listening to the nonsense. Yeah. 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 So I, again, I think it's having in a way, it's like right relationship to the body, right relationship to the outer world, which includes news and getting information um, so that we don't become kind of jaded or, or distrustful. That's not good. Um, you know, it's an incredible thing to be able to know what's going on around the world on any front, COVID-19 or otherwise. Um, and so to really be mindful of how to have that, um, how to have it in your life in the way that it serves for sure. I, I believe um, in such resilience and not to minimize the hardship that anyone is going through, but I also know it's uncomfortable to grow and evolve and change at a personal level and collectively. And so we are going through something and we will be stronger and more resilient in very particular ways on the other side of this. And so that that's the kind of hope that I think is very real. It's not just wishful thinking. It's it's based in how we adapt and evolve and learn and grow, but it's really necessary now. I'm myself starting to see a shift in the news. Like it's not so much all things COVID-19. You know, I think in the first two weeks when it was like, it's 14 days, power through, it's all about this. And then they could get ratings, you know, it's like, 
who would want to watch anything else? But that's shifting now with each week. At least that's my sense. I don't have data on that, but that's good because there are other parts of life and this has to have an important place, but not an exclusive place. Do you see, do you see after this is all over, do you see maybe human interaction between us being better or being different in some way? Like maybe we are more considerate toward, towards one another, more thoughtful of one another, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of, because of this? Yes, and um, while social isolation is having its effect, people are working harder, just like I have to work harder to have that discipline for my physical exercise. And my hope is that this does, this is a sustained new reality of like, I really like having, like I have friends that just live in Portland, but we've been Zooming on Sundays at 10. And I think we're going to keep doing it. It's just so nice. And, you know, we just... <laughs> Life has been so full um, that, you know, and we love each other dearly and we're lifers, but this was a consistency that I don't, it's actually not just about getting through the pandemic and because we can't see each other. This is about making more space. So those are the kind of wake up calls uh, in a way this, this pandemic can give us of making room for new things that then we want to sustain over time. So yes, and even if it is that stranger that all of a sudden maybe I'll see that person, you know, a month from now on that path and we smiled at each other, uh, you know, through our masks and we could tell that that would be my, my hope. Yeah, that's my hope as well. I think that I, I read something the other day about this woman an older lady, and she called someone by accident, and they started talking. So they were <laughs> they were having this conversation, and so now they become friends, and they're like, yeah, "We're going to continue doing this." Exactly. Which is exactly. Great. And it's, I I agree with you. I think that you know this going through something like this will make us have a, a, a be more aware, and I. I truly hope that it does, that it makes us more aware mm -hmm. of one another. It makes us more aware of our environment, um, the need to take care of our environment and mm -hmm. how that if we don't start taking care yeah. of our environment, you know, this is, this is going to happen more often the, the experts have already said, um, I was listening to a, a doctor. She was talking about, this is just going to continue. As long as we continue to ignore our environment, and we continue to um, destroy yeah. habitats of different animals and things of this nature, we're gonna be exposed to this more and more, and this is just gonna to continue to carry on and, uh, even more frequently than it does now. And so... Well, and what a, what a thing to happen to be, wherever you are in terms of identifies, identifying as an environmentalist or not, like this is science and this is real, and this is that now we're in the consequence and, we the, that wakefulness uh just in terms of the environment not just our connection to others uh, that we know and don't know as well as well as what we've been speaking a lot about our own wellness um throughout it that's all of how this time can um inform what happens on the other side of that and even if it's not so black and white of like just goes back to normal it was as if it never happened i i already know myself included it, I, things will be different after this. So whatever portion of people, we'll, we'll just need to be careful of seeing life go back to normal and feeling like all these learnings were for naught because um, many people will be different. Prevention is kind of invisible, you know. They're going to travel differently. They'll go back to traveling, but maybe they'll travel differently um, than before. Walk to the store rather than use a car because now they have nothing better to do. L like those small things that are very hard to track on a on a more global basis. Well, one of the hopes I think, hopes that I have is I, I hope that we become more compassionate and mm. towards other people and, and mm. realize because for many decades now, it's, we've been uh, greedy people. I, honestly, that's, that's mm. the best way I can explain it, is that we, it's all about me, 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 mm -hmm. and what benefits me. And if it doesn't benefit me, I don't have any, you know, mm -hmm. any desire to do anything about it. And I think one of the things that this pandemic has shown us is that if we cared about others, it would help us as well. You know, we're, as a society, everything that we do together benefits us rather than just doing it for me. And uh, go ahead. Well, and yes, and the whole idea of community spread Indigenous cultures, you know, had a mindset of like, 
you, we are all in this together, like we are a tribe. And so in Western culture, much more individualistic, of course. And so this is this, like we saw it, like that doesn't apply to me, you know, whether it's the young adults, you know, still having spring break in your home state, you know, and, and there, you know, it's, it's like this mindset shift to not just we're in this pandemic together, but we are one whole and and not again just even from a nationalistic kind of standpoint that's huge in terms of a shift um, and so as that can remain we can be compassionate and we can understand the interconnectedness that we all have and yes even if it's inconvenient for me that that greater contributing to the the greater good um also is part of my greater good <laughs> right and yeah yeah, and I think that's something that we haven't that we've lost sight of for for again decades. Um, Victor Frankl said something to the effect of, and I'm just paraphrasing. He said, "When we see uh, people who suffer, who are suffering more than we are, rather than looking at them with contempt, we should look at them with compassion, and mm -hmm. we should and we should, you know, as what you've been saying, you know, realize that just because people don't handle things the way you handle them." Right. or they're not able to do the things that you're able to do that you should be looking for a way to help them rather than mm -hmm. just you know look at them with contempt yes. and, and go you know and we do that all the time in every in, in every all different types of areas whether it's financial whether it's relationships or whatever it's like pull yourself up by your bootstraps you know? mm -hmm. well some people don't have bootstraps right so, they're not boots right they're not boots exactly. that's right exactly. yes yes and um to not go political but these are important ideas now we can discuss maybe differently like homelessness in portland is big um you know it's prevalent and so how do we experience that as a community but also with the individual person you know that we stand next or the, our car is next to as they stand on the road with their sign um the stories um you know i'm not even sure what quote i would be thinking of but like i have so not known the waters that this human being has had to navigate and to come with um really deep humility and and kindness um, to stay humble to the privilege that some of us have however we were born into it not discounting the pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps the hard work we've also done i really believe in the idea of duality both can be true i can have privilege and i can have um an incredible um kind of feeling of pride um, in terms of how hard i've worked to manifest the things that i've manifested in one one's life and so yes that that idea that we see the other as not um you know an unreal other they call it in therapy land but a true other kind of namaste um that's huge the outer stuff is just so much about life circumstances and, and it might be you or it might be i that's the next person struggling with you know really maintaining a mortgage and is going to have to look at some form of homelessness doesn't it make us a better per i mean not just a better person doesn't it make us happier when we're com when we're compassionate towards others rather than just being self-centered yeah, well, we I mean, I, I would turn that to our own personal experiment around that, yes. Um, and that I think we it circles back a lot to that ego and sense of worth. In an odd way, some people can feel better when they gossip or put people down, but that's, that's like a feel good then feel awful kind of experience, right? I don't feel really better when I judge someone else because it's, it's a toxic energy inside of me. Um, and so that's the work is to really not to take that low hanging fruit of like, just feel better about yourself by being better than someone or judging. Um, but to have that flood of good feelings when I have compassion, when I see the complexity of a person, I can find their good and I experience their good. Yeah, that's literally chemicals in our brain, actually. Yeah, you, you talk about taking the low hanging fruit and and sometimes again I, I think we're lazy as a people <laughs> we, we we take the little hanging fruit all the time even, mm -hmm. even like when we use humor we use sarcasm because it's mm -hmm. low hanging fruit it's easy yeah to, you know it's right, right. there. <laughs> so right and, and so yeah we we probably need to make a better effort to to reach higher and not just you know 
what's within reach. And yeah, and I actually think we can do that within about 30 seconds, because if I pause, and so when we think of mindfulness, it's not just meditation and sitting and being in the moment. It's a mindful way of eating. It's a mindful way of speaking, and it's a different pace. So if my first instinct, and that can be, we can feel poorly about that because it's just like, wow, my first instinct w was to be rageful before I learned to work with my anger. If I can pause, then I can make a different choice. I can literally move into a different part of my brain. And so if I pause, then something different happens of like, instead of judging that person, I can see the fear, you know, for example, maybe I judge someone who does plastic surgery, like, oh, what's that? They can't be their authentic self. But then I pause and I, with compassion, I can only imagine how afraid they must be to get wrinkles, to age, right? How, how scared. That's a really different thing. You know, then I just do feel compassion, you know, of just like, hey, you don't have to do it for me, you know? You don't have to do it for me. You don't have to look good for me. For and you yet, to be okay. Right. And yet, yeah. if that's what they need to do, if that's what they feel like is necessary for them to feel okay with themselves, I, you know, again, to yes. each his own. It's, and I've, people's, you know, I've, I've had this discussion, oddly enough, I've had this discussion with people where they go, why did they feel that need? And I go, well, let's just say, for instance, you know, you ended up getting a tooth knocked out. You're not going to, mm -hmm. are you not going to have it replaced because it's, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's you know you consider it natural mm -hmm. now to have a hole in your mouth or it, it, because it's not a real tooth that they would have to put back in there you you know we, mm -hmm. we all do things whether it's dye our beards or dye our hair <laughs> or you know or whatever mm -hmm. to make us feel good or the clothes that we buy you know to feel mm -hmm. good about ourselves so if somebody wants to do that and it feel but like you said you don't have to do it for me you know so. do it for you and we can kind of feel like is this coming from fear or love right is it is it just how i want to express myself and what i wear or am i coming from that insecure place again where i have to be a certain kind of attractive to feel like i'm good enough and get that validation from other people i think if we can pause and really kind of key into where the choice is coming from it gives us powerful information about whether you know which kind of wolf we're, we're feeding you know on each you know on, on either shoulder kind of thing and yes absolutely um how we navigate um in our own authentic way the aging process our own choices of how we take care of ourselves for sure yeah I, yeah that's how i i've pretty much lived my life that way to the point where mm -hmm. uh when i first started lifting I, these girls two in particular come to mind would always say oh you, you know my best friend and I we would work out and they go you guys look great don't get any bigger and we would work out more and get bigger and they go oh you look great don't get any bigger and they would say mm -hmm. this each time All right and I, and I realized that I wasn't doing it for them I wasn't doing it for what other right. people thought of me I did it for me and I wanted to yeah. get it you know to the size I wanted to get and even to this day you know I'm more concerned about my strength than I am about Know, whether or not I'm ripped, where everybody is sitting, yeah. you know how good you would look if you lost 20 pounds and just got ripped. I'm like, that's not a. It's, I'm not doing that for you. I'm doing this for me. And yeah. it's the same way with I have people who like my beard gray. I go, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Take a picture and then you have me with a gray beard. Right, if exactly. You want to look at me with a gray beard? <laughs> because yeah. I, to me, I look older and I. And I'm not a big fan of looking older, <laughs> so I was like, yeah. you know, I'll take that that five minutes to dye my beard and and, uh, and look yeah. younger, at least to me. So you know, right. And that can change, Kurt, over time. Right. You know, our, our conversations with ourselves. What I generally see um, in my practice and through working with um, just amazing folks is that there's a brightness and a radiance to um, our awakened self. And when we are that, we are most authentic. We are not in ego. We are, you know, and a lot of the coverings kind of drop away the need for those. So, you know, it's like I can choose to wear makeup, but I don't sense, but it isn't that that's the only form of beauty, right? That as a woman in a culture where there's a lot of people that wear makeup and that's kind of a, a normalized thing or very normalized thing to still feel like I can have that choice. Um, and so less is more is what kind of I see on, on the path of evolution. It could be less is more also not even just about one's looks, but just again in this pandemic, 
less is more, less eating out, you know, mm -hmm. less TV, because now I'm doing different things because I'm burnt out on TV week four. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. so speaking of that, uh, you know, we've taken a break from what we would consider what is our normal life. And so there, to me, this is a time that we can explore the possibility of maybe not ever going back to the life that we once had. I mean, how, how do you see that unfolding? Do you, or do you think that's something that's possible in the long term for most people? I think it's possible and a really positive thing. It's kind of like going on vacation and then um, I always think it's kind of a good road test to how happy we truly are in our life. Not that day-to-day -day life can be a vacation, air quotes here, but it, I would hope it never feels so far off. You know, when I'm on vacation, I'm doing certain activities which are just so beloved to me, but I'm, I'm in love with this work. I'm in love with what I get to do for a living. So it's just like just a different but equal amount of joy. And so as we re-engage in life, kind of in this idea of normal, as that starts to happen and be possible for us, um, we can really be listening for, is this really what I want? Or is this just a habit kind of, of course, I'll get back on all those horses. Kind of the idea of the pause and the self-awareness that you were speaking of earlier, to see if this is still the right path for me, uh, the best choice for me, or this version of it. Again, it's not going to be, I'm not going to exercise at all, but all of a sudden something different happened when sometimes I walked instead of ran, run. You know, it's like, well, I probably want to put a walk in the mix there because, um, you know, so that's, yes, I think it's um, a great opportunity. For some people, they'll go back to their lives and and cherish those lives more. And that's fine too. Just like, oh, I just love what, what life was and now it's back and thank you. And it, we can feel really grateful. So it's the noticing um, on either side of that coin perhaps. Yeah, I, I think um, again, you're absolutely right. I think that there's going to be parts of our life that we're going to, that we're going to really appreciate even more that, mm -hmm. that we missed. And yet this is an opportunity to change those things in our life that we don't want to be part of. You and I are very mm -hmm. fortunate in the fact that we both get to do what we love. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I, you know, I knew when I was 15 years old, what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And not many people can say that. And I right. pretty much throughout my adult life, I've done that. And then I, you know, at this, about a year ago, I decided I wanted to change in my life and I had the means to do so. So now I've started a podcast and, I'm like, <laughs> and I absolutely love, love, love talking to people like you. It's just such mm -hmm. an amazing experience. And mm -hmm. so and the fact that, you know, we both get to do what we love, I think is, is a big part of, uh, of our happiness. And yeah. I think that, people maybe um, during this time should even explore that to go, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the job that I'm doing. It didn't, exactly. You know, it's time to figure out what it is you want to do. Exactly. And I think that's the, um, a little bit the challenge of the uncertainty because people are so scared not enough will be available to us on the other side. It's hard to use this. Like if we knew a hard date of when it would end, it just could feel more like a sabbatical right? And more reflective in that way. But it will end. So our job is to still use it in that way, but not having as much of kind of certainty about a time frame. Yes. Um, and I, I think loving what you do can feel for some people kind of like pie in the sky. Um, and I understand some people don't have a calling like you and I had. I had one for health and then I had one to be a therapist. Like it wasn't like, oh, I wonder what I'll do. But many people struggle with that. They hear you and I speak of this kind of experience, and it's like, I want that, but do I have? Do I go back to school? I don't even know where to start. But we can always start with awareness. We can always start with that sense of listening to the sentiment and taking it seriously, and just seeing over time. Even if I don't do anything this calendar year, I'm noticing I don't want to go back to that job, and my happiness maybe matters to me more and more over time. And so I start to, you know, at least create um, an environment where ideas and ultimately the movement towards something different can happen. I think a lot of times people don't do things 
or absolutely do things out of fear. And I always, and I, I've said this forever and ever, whenever we do anything out of fear or don't do something out of fear, we'll always have regrets, always. Mm. And so, you know, again, this is a time, I think, for most, for a lot of people where they could take this time and like you said, there are some people out there, they don't even know what they want to do. They don't have a calling. And so it can be a, a, more of a challenge for them to figure out what it is, what they want to do. And I go, well, this is a time you figure out what you don't want to do. And eliminate <laughs> right. Well, that, that's, that's a great point. And that's what I, you know, it's like, where do I start? Well, we already know some things aren't on the list, right? right. It's called <laughs> what you're doing now. Um, yes. And I remember um, my sister really inspired me when I was growing up and she, I was still at home and she was heading off to become a teacher at a time in Oregon where there was too many teachers. And it was this idea of like, yeah, but I love this and this is what I want to do. And if she had looked at the statistics, she never would have become a teacher. She's retired now, had a full career teaching many different grades, but ended up being a kindergarten teacher at the end. Like that was really her path, but it didn't pencil out on paper. So that's the other thing is not to, to trust the process that if this is really right for you, and especially if you're flexible about the form it takes at least for a while um, to not kind of be aware of where we can um, be pretty discouraged, you know, not have enough um, outer maybe uh, supports or green lights, so to speak. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, and it's great to be informed. And yet again, like you said, um, it, you don't become discouraged because and I, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but there was a guy who became a very successful businessman. He said, you know, if I had known the things that I know now, I would never have started my business. I started it in a recession. Everyone was saying, this is crazy to start a business exactly. during this time. And yet right. he became very successful because he didn't know that you, wouldn't, that you shouldn't start a business at this right. time. Right. So he right. became very successful because of it. You know, yeah. and, and then, you know, for instance, I've been given this a, a lot of times in everything that I've done, you know, especially with the podcast. I go, well, do you know how many people are doing podcasts and they don't make any money? <laughs> and I go, right. yeah, and yet there are people out there who are. And and so mm -hmm. I don't become discouraged because of, the, because of those who don't do. I become encouraged because of those who do. Yeah. And as far as competition goes, Arnold Schwarzenegger said it the best as far as I was, I'm concerned. He was on the... Um, he was on the uh, Tonight Show, and I and and Jayla and him and and, and uh, Sylvester Stallone both had a movie out at the same time. And uh, he goes, "Well, if if someone's going to go see a movie, whose movie should they go see?" And and Arnold said, "Well, they should go see both. They're both great movies." You know, he wasn't afraid of competition. So right. just you know, if you had yeah. Colonel Sanders who, or not Colonel Sanders, but if you had Dave Thomas who who started Wendy's Hamburgers. And he said, well, there's McDonald's and there's Burger King, there's Burger Chef, there's, you know, right, it, it, right. it would be crazy for me to get into this because there's so much competition. He would yeah. never have made the business that he did. And so I think, you know, not becoming overwhelmed, like you said, and, and just having faith in yourself and belief in mm -hmm. yourself that this is what if this is what you're supposed to do and you know it this is inside your heart like your sister yeah. wanting to be a teacher all yeah. the other factors go away yeah. and just yeah. you know keep that drive yeah exactly and i think it tests the flexibility muscle when i went back to uh, when this calling happened for me i was very securely in a job with public health you know had a great schedule had retirement set. My husband was um, very surprised when I came back from a retreat and said, guess what? Um, and it was a, a crazy uh, retreat where, um, and this sounds kind of mean what they did, but it served the purpose very well. We each had to name a dream and this had come to me like a calling. And in my little small group, six to eight people, I think, they all basically kind of shouted at me literally shouted and said all the things about why it couldn't happen and what i had to find inside myself in a very intense moment is this what you're speaking of this deep deep i do deserve this i don't know how i'm going to go get another master's degree i don't know if i'll make it in private practice there's a lot of therapists out there like i had to find it within me 
Um, so when I went home, because that was in California, it was so funny, telling my husband was so anticlimactic. <laughs> He's just like, are you sure, Kath? I'm like, oh, man, that's nothing, babe. <laughs> I'm so crystal clear. So I always imagine, not that everybody would choose into something like that. I've always been a fan of personal work and personal retreats kind of thing. But just what are those six to eight, you know, forces that are going to shut you down and tell you no and all the things and that we have this kind of like this voice that comes out of the rubble that says yes to that dream. And, and don't let anyone or anything diminish that voice. Mm -hmm. because, and unfortunately, and this is, I, I don't know if you found this, I've found that sometimes those who have your best intentions at heart tend to be the worst critics because they're looking, you know, I, I always think it's one of two reasons. One is they're trying to protect you. And so they're saying, you don't want to do this because they don't want to see you get hurt or fail or, any of that, or anything like that. And not realizing that they're, they're actually, it, mothers do this to children a lot of times uh, mm -hmm. where they'll sit there and go, no, 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 because they're trying to protect their child. And, um, and they stunt their growth because of it because they won't allow that child to do these things and learn these things and, mm -hmm. and realize that failure is part of growth you know it's a yeah. huge part of growth and yeah so we have loved ones who do it for that reason and then i think we also have those who are close to us who are friends or family or whatever who will sit there and, and tell you oh you can't do that you don't want to do that because if you succeed then they feel like well, if he can succeed and I haven't succeeded, they start feeling bad about themselves because you did something they weren't able to do. And yeah, when we start getting honest about how happy we are and then we start to do something about it, um, you know, it can make the humans around us kind of uncomfortable because what right. does that look like? And even without getting into their business, it's like, wow, Kurt, you're really, wow, you're paying attention to your life. What am I doing with mine? Right, because right? we kind of look for sameness and similar experience, the kindred spiritness of that, to validate our own choices. And when somebody differentiates from that, when they go left, go left. When we're going right, it's like wow. So, but that's powerful information about well, if I'm watching myself feel even an illogical kind of threat by something Kurt's doing. It's really not about what Kurt's doing. It's about the stirring that's going on inside. The reaction is really all mine. It's just as triggered by you. And those that are kind of working the idea of wakefulness relationally understand that so much of what happens in the waters of relationship really is powerful invitation to ourselves. It can start though as a judgment or a reaction or as something, um, but it's to work with it in, in the wisdom of what it really has to offer. Yeah, I think it's it's not about what what you're doing it's what it's about more about what they're not doing and, mm -hmm. and you know, that they have to they have to reflect on their own yeah you know. right i believe so much in law of attraction of the idea that and natural consequences in a way like if if somebody's not going to evolve and grow um if that's not what they see for themselves if they're content with where they are then I really trust that. And I know that if there is something they're missing, and I speak from experience, this, all, this was me, those consequences eventually show up. And that if they need to hit more of a rock bottom, you know, then that's, then that's their journey. That's their path. Right. Um, <laughs> and for some of us, it takes rock bottom. Before yeah, I know. Yeah, really <laughs> scraping our rear end there for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Getting yeah. to know rock bottom. <laughs> There's that, that's your next book. <laughs> Getting to know rock bottom. There you go. There you go. No, that's, you're absolutely correct. And, and so, again, to, I guess to just reiterate for people out there, it's like, you know, trust yourself. And trust mm -hmm. that, you know, trust your feelings that, you, especially like, again, I'm sure with you that as with me, I knew what I wanted to do beyond the shadow of a doubt. And when you have that kind of conviction to deny it would be mm -hmm. tragic. I truly believe it would be tragic to know that, um, that you went in a different path than, than what you know you should have gone. Well, and what we spoke of initially uh, for this interview, that sense of having worth will give us the fortitude, you know, because then whatever I do, 
So I didn't write this book other than it just came through to do that. It felt important. You know, I can't be my kid's therapist. I felt like sometimes my clients needed more than what we could even do in a session or a way to keep all the stuff at hand. Like it just came, but, but I also was able to do it because I hadn't attached my worth to how well the book does. Same thing with going back to school. I didn't know before I started a master's program if I would have any clients. And so that conviction and not doing something achievement wise or otherwise to prove anything, but because it comes from deep inside um, is so helpful because we, we don't know how, we can't control all of the outcomes. But if we don't do, we don't listen to that voice and that calling, whatever form, work or otherwise, it's a practice of self-abandonment. I would go as far as to say that. And that is not what I want to be looking at if I'm gifted enough to live till 85 or 92. I don't want to look back and go, I was too afraid that I would either fail, didn't have the worth to know that there's, there's not a failing. It is going to be what it's going to be. But to give myself that life experience and to be in the flow of however it was going to unfold. So, yes. And I think both you and I are examples of it's never too late either. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes. honestly, uh, you know, I know people think I'm crazy that at this point in my life that I would just change my, you know, my uh, career. And it's yeah. like, but I knew in my heart it was time to change careers. I need it and I want it a, yeah. a, a bigger challenge. And so I could stay with what I've done my whole life, knowing that I've loved it. And over the past few years, I knew I was like, it's, it's starting to wane. It's time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another, another thing is that, you know, just because you've done something your whole life doesn't mean you have to do it the rest of your life. If, if there's a calling inside you again, like with you, you know, you had another calling and you're like, you have to go after it mm -hmm. uh, again, because like you said, if you don't, it is, it, that's great word abandonment, you know, um, if you if you don't you are abandoning yourself and, and, and yeah you are. exactly so, you and know. i would go as far as to say for some people um like leaving a little hungry like i loved public health yeah. i wasn't done done because i wouldn't want that being burnt out hating to go every day it never it wasn't there it was waning that's a great word that's how i knew change was something almost like mary poppins you know it was like oh i can feel the wind something's changing here but um you know loving where we were even though it's time to go um is really a, a great analogy about also how we love people like i'm gonna leave hungry i'm not gonna be done loving the people i love in my life when i go or they go um it's a harder walk when that that happens you know there's more loss there's more pain in that heartbroken way but there's so much more love so just being able to follow where love takes us i know it's kind of woo woo in a way but whether it's that calling inside or loving deeply and not being afraid of loss um, and having the knowing we have capacities for that. Um, yes, yeah, so important. Yeah, so I, important. I know some sh some loves I should have left earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that leave 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 when there's a great period at the end of the sentence. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. For sure. Um, I want so. <sighs> I kind of want to wrap this up a little bit, but I want to talk about your book, River to Ocean. And uh, are you, so this is a, this is a new book, right? I mean, you're a brand new author. Is that correct? I'm a brand new author. Um, I'm, I was really um, touched and thankful for uh, an endorsement by Tara Brock. So she's kind of out there as a, Buddhist, but psychotherapist that has done a lot of work through, through the years. Um, but this started again years ago with just this kind of like, okay, this book is supposed to happen. And even the framework for the book already was there. And then I ended up hiring um, somebody to really help me do professional writing and do the publishing process. All of that was new to me because I don't have a background in that. So yeah, published last um, August and we're on the journey of taking it wherever river to ocean is going. It's kind of like my, I feel like it's telling me where it's going to be. It's, it's just to be, it's like, it's like my seventh child in a way. Um, so yeah. 
Well, I admire you for the fact that you actually got a book published. I've been writing one for years. It, <laughs> as probably everybody out there has. I, I actually, know. I'm about halfway through. It's just, you know, such, you a, it's such a challenge. So I admire the fact that you're able to complete uh, I had a real kind of um, moment in the fall, not last fall, but the fall before it was the final year of like, because I put it to readers, then you have a bunch of edits, and my readers were really honest, and they, they really were part of the book. It, it so took it to another level, but it meant going back and writing more, and I finally, I just had to kind of look within myself and say, you can choose out like do you want because if you're going to see it through we're going to really see it through and we're going to do it right we're going to give it everything we have um so that whatever the outcome is i can look back and say i did right by this book and so i had to give myself a choosing out option chose back in it was an intense spring just again getting that endorsement getting it up and ready all the different distribution kinds of things um, but I'm really glad. So I can feel, I can remember that middle stage of writing. It's just the, the slog of that was really hard. Um, so I wish you well in that and, and to keep supporting <laughs> yourself because on the other side of it, um, I am so glad I have something that I can hand a friend or um, a client or can be available to people I'll never meet or see. Um, I. I was ready to die at 16 and so this journey to this life now and being able to put everything I was ever given into a book so that I can pay that forward to others um, is one of the most rewarding things that I could um, imagine and have experienced so thank you for referencing it I really appreciate that oh it's my pleasure like I said I it's it's such a uh, it's such a great read and it's such an easy read and there's, oh, and, good. There's, and there's so much i mean it's it's just packed with so much great information and extras and i love the exercises because i think mm. it's one thing for for us to tell people this is what you need to do it's exactly another, it's another to show them how to do it because i can sit there and i can go you need to love yourself and they'll go okay well how do you do that and i go i don't know i've always loved myself <laughs> 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 well, it's the, and it's where the neurodevelopment is. We, I mean, we can have a cognitive awareness of something, but it's actually to know I should have intrinsic worth and love myself, but not know how to do that actually creates shame inside of me. So right. I felt like it. There's a lot of wonderful self-help books out there on much of these ideas, but it felt essential um, to give people the fishing pole to give people the path to transformation in healing. Um, so yeah, I, I believe in that strongly and, um, that's a lot of it is, it sounds really good, but I, how do I get there myself? And the stories from the field, were there any that you were particularly resonant with or? Uh, just some of the stories that I read, uh, the one about the, the guy who, I want to say he worked, he didn't work for IBM. He worked for a tech company i believe it was and uh and and again i don't have the connection to the stories that other people will because i haven't gone through what mm -hmm. a lot of the people in your stories have gone through because i've been yeah. um while my ego has has you know kept me on a path that that kept me from growth at times i've always been very aware of things and handling and how i handle things mm -hmm. um, which i can Thank That's my wonderful. father, which is, I've always yeah. been able to manage those things without anxiety, without being anxious and, and not going through a lot of what the, your stories, the people in your stories have gone through. And so it probably didn't connect with me as much as it mm -hmm. would with other people who actually deal mm -hmm. with those things. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate your honesty and, you know, on the worth piece, um, and my daughter is fine with me sharing this, that um, I had one story and it was with a man who really had an absent father as you read in the story. And then he, that's why he didn't feel good about himself. But my daughter was one of the readers that fall um, and said, you know, mom, this doesn't resonate for me because I was raised by you and dad. And you always told me I was good enough, but I've been at 25, she really struggled with a sense of being good enough that didn't come from an absent parent, didn't come from the traditional way we think of circumstance. So um, that that's what I wanted to offer through the book is um, different, you know, people's journey with these kinds of ideas. And you are really lucky to have been gifted with the 
like um, sense of how to manage life, you know, that your dad, it sounds like in particular, really provided for you. Um, and it's funny because I didn't have a particularly close relationship with my father, but, and, and again, um, but there were certain things about him that I was able to get from him. Now there were mm -hmm. other things that weren't good, you know, and, yeah. and again, yeah. you know, this, uh, he had this really, uh, this outlook about money as though it was a, like he came from a place of scarcity. Mm, yeah. So, you know, growing up, it's like, I always heard, well, what do you think money grows on trees and that kind of right, stuff. And right. So I realized in my adult life that, you know, issues that I had with maybe breaking a barrier of, of, of uh, income and bringing in more money stemmed from, from, you know, yeah. those things that I heard. I also realized that, you know, unlike a, a lot of people out there, I don't blame my father for any anything. I go, my father did the best job that he was capable mm -hmm. of doing that, you know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, and I think that's important that we don't blame others. We go, okay, yeah. this, this was the childhood we had, and these are the things that happened to us, and they happen to us for a reason, but those things can build us and make us stronger there you know that's again where our growth comes from the growth doesn't come from when life is easy and everything's given to you that yeah and so yeah go ahead, go ahead well i you're speaking to kind of a clinical piece but i think it's nice to mention it in this kind of format so um i work with people's defenses about going to those places where we need to venture so that one can heal and one can transform pain into um you know um a different state but we have to go there and if we have too much of a parental uh, defense which is called parental loyalty it feels like if i acknowledge that um, my parent didn't give me he or she everything um, i needed then i'm somehow disloyal to them so i love your words of he did do the best he could and then it's this magic word of and and you didn't get everything that you needed from him and as long as as a therapist i help people hold space for that parent that did their best and probably improved things actually from what they got that's what generations right. usually do then we can do both we can respect and honor and be grateful and yet not do what's called a bypass where i'm ignoring actually the effects of not getting everything i needed through injury or loss or something that are actually in my adult life playing out if i don't reconcile that if i don't heal that if i don't resolve that yeah just out of curiosity, if it's not too personal, you said that your daughter um, came from this sense of not being, uh, not having the self worth or and being worthy enough, and yet she had both parents. Where did her, did her stem from? Like apparently, you can get this lack of self worth from other than just your parents. Well, just I, what I would remind us is that we live in a culture where it's pretty much conditional worth. So even if you know, I, if I like, you know, raised her in a hut and she'd never been exposed to the outside world, um, perhaps it, she would not have struggled. Um, so it's that I think she had to get kind of right about herself and, you know, do what a lot of people do in their 20s, kind of go through their, uh, walk their coals of kind of who am I, you know, how do I take care of myself, what's happening to my relationships, that kind of stuff. So it ended up being not just about worth, but really about loving herself, who she is, and she made some changes. Um, and that was super helpful. So just the starting of, I don't feel intrinsically worthy, but it doesn't make sense, got her to where she needed to be, that ultimately meant some very behavioral and physical changes, not just kind of emotional, feel, emotionally feeling better about herself. Well, I think yeah. what I what I'd like to say is that for everybody out there who who feels like they want to make this change, they want to you know they want to become a better version of themselves. I would recommend highly that they get your book, River. Oh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I do mean that. And I don't. And I'm not a person who just you know flippantly gives out recommendations unless Thank I believe you. in something. And and that's why it was important to me to read your book, to mm. you know, because mm. I you know I want. If I hadn't believed in it, I wouldn't speak about it. I'd go, mm -hmm. oh yeah, she wrote a book. <laughs> well, thank it. you. 
So. And if I can offer one quick thing, it's river to ocean, living in the flow of wakefulness. There are apparently a lot of river to, I, you know, I didn't think, of, I just, the name came to me as the metaphor and I'm still, I still love it. But um, you might, to get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble or pals.com, those are the three places, um, plus libraries. I made sure I got into libraries. Wow. Um, you'd want uh, river to ocean, living in the flow of wakefulness. Yeah, I just wanted it available to anybody free or otherwise, um, that, that needed it. And I'll provide a link, uh, for everybody out there on both my YouTube channel and on the, uh, on the mm. uh, podcast as well. So that people who want to find your book can find it. And, and, uh, so yeah, I was going to ask you thank where you. they can find it. So thank you for doing that. Well, and the and the other place is my uh, the website uh, that you'll probably post too, because then if they right. want an autograph graph copy, um, they're welcome to get that, and then I send it out to them directly. So, you no, know, just for a suggestion, you might want to do an audio book. <laughs> I was looking for that. I, I hear you. I, it's the next stage. Yes. <laughs> it's a very interesting process. Apparently, uh, if I want to read my own book, um, I need to audition. Oh, really? So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if I'd be the person. Um, my voice is a lot in the book. You can probably tell having read it, you know, this, I wanted people to really feel me with them. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's a whole, it's a whole new land this yeah. book publishing land. Congratulations on, on, thank you. Uh, on your book. Thank you, Kurt, so much. And thank you for this conversation. It was lovely and your um, support of my work. Um, well, and I, I wish you very well in all of this personally. Um, thank to you. be well, be safe, yes. And thank you for being a guest on the show and thank you for your, uh, for your advice and helping people during this, you know, this challenging time to, you know, to help them get through this. I think that the work that you're doing is extremely important. Like I said, it's important that we that we um, stay physically healthy, but again, it's just as important, if not more important, to be mentally healthy during these times, yeah. and and to be aware that uh, that we need both and not just one or the other. So thank That's you right. so much. That's for right. And uh, it's it's just uh, it's been a great show, and I and I really appreciate you you being here with me today. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. Take good care. All right. Thank We're doing great work too. Keep keep going. I love the calling. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. You, you yeah. take care. Okay.